Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the ADSET webinar. This webinar is called Words Matter, Developing Inclusive Language Guides in Tertiary Education Settings. My name is Gabrielle O'Brien and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Senior Project Officer for ADSET, which stands for the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Educational Training. This webinar is being live captioned by Jason from Bradley Reporting. To activate the captions, click on the CC button in the toolbar that is located either on the top or bottom of your screen. We we'll also have captions available via your browser and Jane will add that information to the chat box now. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people in Mianjin or Brisbane, Queensland. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today and acknowledge their ongoing connection to country, land and sea. Feel free to put what country you are in the chat and share where you are. You can also add your pronouns to your Zoom signature or in the chat box if you wish. Before we begin, just some minor housekeeping information. Um, please ensure your mic is off and phones are on silent. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available on the ADSET website in the coming days uh, with the presentation slides as well. Throughout the presentation, feel free to use the chat box with us and each other, but please remember to choose everyone so that we can all see and read what you have to say. If you have a question that you would like to ask at the end for our presenters, please use the Q&A box. If you have any technical difficulties, please email admin at adset.edu.au. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Stevie Lane and Kay Barnard from Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. It's quite early there compared to um, where everybody else is on the East Coast. Uh, Stevie works as an equity practitioner at ECU on a range of initiatives to address inequality and systematic barriers that impact people who identify as LGBTIQA plus and people with disability. Stevie also has significant experience in external LGBTIQA plus organisations as a trainer, communications consultant, videographer and writer to educate and advise on national policy. Kay has recently joined ECU as an equity project coordinator, including initiatives for students and staff. Again, Kay has extensive experience as a disability advocate in projects for young people with disability, centered on employment, self-advocacy and educational rights. Both our speakers have expertise and lived experience to draw on, which is why we are delighted to have them speaking to us today. So I'll leave you with Stevie and Kay to share what, um, their lived experience and expertise can tell us about inclusive language initiatives in tertiary education. Thank you, Stevie and Kay. Hello, and thank you so much for having us here today. Um, my name is Stevie. Uh, as was mentioned, and I use they, them pronouns. Um, we'll be talking a bit about today of uh, Words Matter, developing inclusive language guides in a tertiary setting. And um, we'll be drawing throughout the presentation um, on our lived experience and hope that uh, through doing that, um, we'll be able to contextualize some situations and help in whatever practice uh, you are, are doing in your day-to-day -day, um, working setting as well. So again, thank you so much for having us. Uh, firstly, I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which um, myself and Kay are coming from today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay respects to elders past and present. This was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. And I extend this uh, acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, the a lot of what's happening at the moment, uh, particularly in the Noongar community and send out my condolences. Um, there's a, a lot of violence happening in, in the community and, and has been since colonization, but particularly at the moment, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, in the Noongar community, um, there will be a lot of um, mourning happening at the moment. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, in the presentation, we'll be talking uh, about some topics that may be uh, sensitive or maybe upsetting to some people. Um, so just wanting to, to put that out there at, at the moment. Um, those kind of topics 
uh, are brought up within the inclusive language guide as well. So there is a, a content warning in the guide itself. Um, if you have read it already, if, if you haven't, we do encourage you to go and read it. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be talking mostly about um, the development of the guides as opposed to the content of the guide itself. But um, we do really encourage you to go read it if you haven't already. I'll pass over to Kay now. Uh, thank you, Stevie. Um, so why are we talking about an inclusive language guide and why have ECU decided to design and release an inclusive language guide? An inclusive language guide is really important because it goes beyond acknowledging someone's lived experience to affirming that the way that they see themselves and they see the communities that they are part of. So in my context, for people with disability, often we are told by service providers and doctors um, the way that we should see ourselves, the way that we should describe our lived experience and the way that we should build community. And having an inclusive language guide that's built on the lived experiences of people with disability takes that power back. It gives us power to say that this is the words that we use to describe ourselves. This is the way that we see ourselves, our community and how we fit into our society as a whole. So having an inclusive language guide at a university goes beyond just acknowledging that we have students with different lived experiences and part of different equity groups and we see them and we acknowledge them and we believe the way that they describe themselves and the way that they see their communities. As a university we have a responsibility to create safety and equity for students and we also need to acknowledge that the way that our university is set up to have systemic power over people and students in these equity groups. So having an inclusive language guide that's the way we have an agreement for the way that we see people with disability people from different equity groups, the queer community, people who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and the way that we talk about them um, and how we set up that power dynamic in a university. And also ensuring, because we look at the lived experience of people, ensuring that people have autonomy over their communities and over their stories. Um, language also reflects society and culture. So as a society, the way that we've used language historically has put together particular representations of equity groups and also perceptions that we have about the capacity and the value of people. So things that as a disabled person, and I think I speak for all my disabled peers on the webinar today, things that I often hear as a person with autism are things like, you're brave for just existing. Uh, terms like that really reflect the way that people think about disability as something horrible and something unmanageable and something that you need to be brave to see through. Um, also things like, let's focus on ability, those kinds of microaggressions and those kinds of nuanced emotive language when we talk about disability reflect the way that people people see us and the people see our value and our ability to exist within society. Um, having an inclusive language guide also needs to be nuanced. So we need to think uh, beyond black and white perceptions of this language is inclusive and this language is not inclusive and the way that people may use different language in different environments around different people in different situations and for different purposes. Um, from my own lived experience as an autistic person, often the idea of identity first and person first language is a question that I get asked about a lot. Um, and the question isn't just black and white preferring identity first or um, person first language. And for me, it's really context dependent. So when I go to the doctor, it's really important for me to use person first language because when I use identity first language, often the way that I see myself and the way that my symptoms are seen by my doctor is then chalked up to the fact that I'm autistic instead of really acknowledging that yes I may have autism but I'm beyond my disability able to have symptoms that don't fit within my autism profile so I might move between different ways of describing myself and have different comfort levels around the way that I use identity first and person first language um, Personally, I use identity first language to acknowledge that as an autistic person, my experience of autism is not separable from my experience of personhood and what it's like to be a person existing in an autistic brain. Um, so my autism shapes all of the interactions that I have with people, the way that I see myself, the way that I see other people and build community. So acknowledging that different, different things can be true at the same time and different inclusive language can be right in different contexts. Oops, sorry, bear with me. 
Um, so what is inclusive language and why is it important? Um, inclusive language is a sign of respect and reflects how far that we've come from, in, I can speak particularly on a disability context, from the disability rights movement of the 1960s and the tireless advocacy from disability advocates. We've got to a point now where disability and the way that we see disabled people in society is completely different from the way that we viewed disability 100 years ago. And also legislative changes in disability have have trickled down into society and also words that we use to describe communities. So things like the Americans with Disabilities Act of the 1990s, um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, and in an Australian context, the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992, um, all of these legislative changes have, have really have come from all this tireless advocacy from disability advocates throughout the world. And also it's trickled down into the way that we see disability now and the way that disability is constantly evolving. Um, historically, we've seen a lot of charity models of disability as seeing disabled people as something that should be pitied or people should feel sorry for, um, or that it must be so horrible to be a disabled person. But now we see that disabled people have autonomy over their lives, have that self-determination. So it's important that when we talk about language at a university level, that we reflect this as well, that we reflect that disabled students have autonomy over their experiences at university, but also over the words and the content that their lecturers and tutors present to them. Um, inclusive language also promotes mental health and well-being um, for trans students, almost, sorry, content warning about suicidality. For trans students, 50% of trans young people have attempted suicide um, in their life. However, when we use their um, affirmed name or we use their affirmed pronouns, that drops by 65%. So reflecting that they are experts in their own lived experience and that we believe that they are who they say they are um, is really important for mental well-being for, for students who are trans and gender diverse. Um, it also makes sure that we avoid stereotypes that we have about people and also acknowledging and thinking about why we think particular ways about people um, in a disability context. For me, when I was at school, we didn't really talk about disability all that much. Um, I went to a segregated school that separated disabled students from non-disabled students and floated in between both of those streams. Um, so we've separated disabled students um, in a really crucial period where children are learning about what it's like to exist in a diverse society. So, his, so when those students then grow up, they might not understand disability or how normal it is to have disabled students in your class, how normal it is to have that diversity of experiences within your cohort. Um, and then that reflects into adults who might not understand different diversity groups because they've never been exposed to it before. So that brings all those stereotypes and disrespectful discrimination from a lack of ignorance or understanding around what it's like to be a person in a diverse body. When we think about setting up an inclusive language guide, it's really important that we think about how language is formed and changed through colonization and how our views of diversity is reflected in historical inequalities and colonization in Australia, in an Australian context. So colonization still has a devastating experience on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, and it impacts the lang language and understanding on which we have to, when we describe Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. For example, from the British, we have we have adopted very Western ways of thinking and even reflecting in our inclusive language guide, a lot of the language that we talk about is still very much from that Western perspective. So things like um, in a disability context, when we talk about the medical system and the medical understanding of disability as disability being um, a deficit or a divergence from normal and that there is a normal way and a usual way of existing and people with disability diverge from that. So that's a very Western way of thinking about disability and that's not reflected in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities now or even before colonisation. That's not how these communities understand disability and understand diversity and things like binary systems of gender where it's very, is again, a very Western way of thinking about male and female and having only those two options, only those two diversities in our society. That's also a very Western way of thinking and that doesn't exist in Torres Strait Islander communities and um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and reflects um, that very colonised perspective. Um, so we need to be 
inclusive and we need to be um, we need to acknowledge the way that colonisation has changed and affected um, the way that we think about different diversity topics. For example, um, in the disability perspective, when we think about the medical model of disability, um, that is a very British perspective. And during the reign of the medical mo model of disability, people with disability were seen as monsters or as freaks or things that needed to be fixed. Um, and disabled people, including disabled children, were often institutionalised um, in asylums or homes. Um, and they were forced to take medication that, that changed the way that their body moved the way that their brains thought about things um, and we can still see that western perspective now in things like in the autism space things like applied behavior analysis where um, children often but also adults um, are treated in a way to remove remove that neurodiversity to remove those traits um, and become more normalized or become more neurotypical and be praised for appearing more neurotypical independent of the harm that that might be causing them. Um, it's also the similar idea with sexuality um, and the idea that homophobic laws are very much a Western way of thinking and a Western um, construct. Uh, we can all see that now as well when we talk about intersex communities and the idea that intersex children will have these operations that are unnecessary and are incredibly harmful to their identities um, against their will uh, to become more normalised or become more less um, diverse. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about the development of ECU's uh, inclusive language guide uh, now that we've gone a, a little bit into why and um, the context behind it. So um, in terms of uh, the development itself, I think it was really important for um, from an ECU perspective for it to be a really collaborative uh, approach and for it to be driven through um, lived experience uh, and professional expertise but putting that lived experience at the forefront of what we were doing was really important for us um, particularly seeing as language itself can be so empowering to diverse communities and we really wanted to reflect that in what we were putting together and ensure that um, people were able to take the inclusive language guide apply it and be able to empower uh, you know you know, in classrooms, be able to empower students or within the staff environment, be able to empower other staff members. Uh, so that again, as, as Kay was mentioning, we're able to take things away from that very sort of medicalized, um, very clinical kind of way that diverse communities are often contextualized and, and thought about. And we're able to actually, um, you know, give people different ideas and understandings of what it means to be um, a queer person or a disabled person or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, so it was really important for it to be collaborative and for it to be run and driven by lived experience. And that included um, staff and student lived experience. Um, so for myself, I'm a, a trans and gender diverse person and a queer person. Um, and I've also recently started identifying as a disabled person as well. So um, I um, was able to, within our equity projects team, coordinate that and utilize the lived and professional expertise of other people within the equity projects office. Um, as well as people from around the university. So for example, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander section um, was written by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from our, our Centre of Indigenous Australian Education and Research. So um, we tried to ensure throughout that it was, it was written by people who belong to those communities because really um, as much as we try to understand um, other communities, it's, it's only those people within those communities that can really understand um, what is in-group language, what is appropriate to say, you know, within communities and what is appropriate for, say, for people to say outside of those communities and what is a respectful way to address particular communities. Um, we also had input from our Athena Swan team um, who looked at gender specifically um, and our international office who looked at how we approach um, diverse communities, particularly our international students from that particular context as well. Um, we had input from our subcommittees, um, our Pride at ECU and our Disability Access and Inclusion subcommittee, which again, both had that lived experience at the core of it, um, which proved really helpful uh, in 
in really sort of, you know, um, putting that information into the guide. Um, and we also tried to ensure that it was aligned with other documents that existed within the university as well, which was really important. Um, so aligning things with our corporate communications team to ensure that any kind of existing content that talked about um, diverse uh, language um, is in alignment with, with what we have within the guide. Um, and there's not, nothing that really sort of, um, I guess, goes against what's in the guide. Um, so it all kind of aligns throughout. Um, something that I think often gets missed when it comes to developing any kind of document um, is that we have, you know, a lot of people who have extensive knowledge and, you know, lived experience and all that kind of stuff, which, which really does need to be at the core, but we forget that we need to sort of test out um, the documents that we create and the resources that we create uh, to ensure that it's understandable by people who might not have as much knowledge and as much uh, information and experience uh, with that. So um, it was really important for us to actually have staff as part of that process who didn't have that particular knowledge, who didn't have that exposure or that extensive um, extensive ideas and knowledge around inclusive language uh, so that we could sense check it before putting it out to the wider community. And what we've found is that um, it has been uh, a really valuable part of the process to, to ensure that we're not um, conveying information that can't be understood by the average person, um, ensuring that we're not sort of um, talking about language in a way that is, you know, people can't necessarily understand that language or understand the meaning behind why that language has been used. Um, in terms of the different sort of aspects of the inclusive language guide, um, it's been split up into a number of different sections. However, we were really um, adamant that we had to include at the start of the document and acknowledge the intersectionality that exists between each of these areas as well. Um, and that's originally why um, uh, you know, as, as part of starting this inclusive language guide, we originally started looking um, from an LGBTIQA plus perspective of doing doing one for the queer community um, and looking at inclusive language from that perspective. But um, it just didn't seem like quite enough. It seemed like we needed to talk about inclusive language more broadly um, and really acknowledge that intersectionality that exists within a lot of these communities. Uh, because without doing so, it didn't really seem like we were providing a full picture of what inclusive language is for the whole of the communities that exist um, within ECU, but also within any university or within any society more broadly. Um, the first uh, edition or the first version that we released um, had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander age, disability, sex, gender and sexuality, race, race ethnicity and culture and religion and belief. Um, and then after putting that guide out, um, it was uh, realised that we definitely needed to have a mental health section as well, because there's a lot of um, marginalisation of people who experience mental illness or mental health issues. And so we really needed to have uh, some language in there to talk about inclusive language from that perspective as well. So that was added later on. Um, something that we acknowledge um, in having the, the document publicly available um, is that it is an evolving document and we acknowledge that language is always changing and evolving. And so we encourage people to reach out to us if they find that actually some language is becoming more outdated and something needs to change, or there's any real obvious gaps that we've missed. Um, as much as we tried for it to be a collaborative um, process with lots of different people involved, um, there's always going to be things that are potentially missed. And so we really are open to receiving that feedback and we really encourage anyone that we share the guide with that if, if there is any anything missing or if anything seems off um, to please contact us so that we can um, include that in the next um, round that we're going to release um, you know whenever we update it the next time we update it which, which we try to do relatively often or we're going to try to do relatively often um, something that I think um, from my perspective as, as a queer person uh, and as a trans person was particularly interesting in terms of how we categorize things was the um, section of sex gender and sexuality um, so we went through and looked at lots, lots of different existing inclusive language guides from universities, but also outside of the tertiary sector as well. And often, and often is as the case with, with talking about these issues more generally, is that um, we talk about LGBTIQA plus people and gender equality for women um, as two separate issues. And so when we were looking at putting together this inclusive language guide, we were trying to figure out a way to, um, I guess, acknowledge the gender inequalities that exist 
uh, in both uh, for both women and for both trans and gender diverse people as well, because realistically both of them are talking about gender, but they're often just talked about in different contexts. So I think we ended up coming to the conclusion that it was really important for us to include sex, gender and sexuality within the same context and talk about <laughs> gender from a, a women equality um, perspective, but then also talk about gender um, in terms of trans and gender diversity, because there is so much intersectionality between those two. And again, as I mentioned, um, when we're talking about gender, um, when we're talking about, you know, gender equality, we need to be encompassing um, and talking about the diverse and nuanced experiences of women and of gender diverse people without um, separating the issue too much because there is so much intersectionality that exists within those communities um, and there's a lot of women that exist within both there's trans and gender diverse people that are you know impacted by gender inequality so it's important to really bring those topics together in terms of some feedback um, that we've received and, and ways that we've tried to update um, the inclusive language guide. As I mentioned before, the mental health section has been added, which has been um, a really valuable part of, um, I guess, talking about all communities. Um, realistically, we know that um, because of discrimination experienced by lots of different communities, um, there is higher rates of uh, mental health, uh, mental health issues and suicidality. So it's really important from a mental health and wellbeing perspective um, to look at that um, within the context of diverse communities as well, um, but also with people more broadly. Um, in terms of things uh, that staff and students have been able to do in terms of um, using the guide itself, um, people have been able to use the guide to embed inclusive language into their curriculum. And I think that can be a really empowering thing because it means that we can empower our students um, to be more inclusive in whatever practice, whatever area of study that they're in. Um, we can really sort of display that language and show by example um, what, is what is appropriate and how to have respectful conversations about diverse communities. Um, in terms of um, from a student perspective, um, we've had feedback from students saying that they've been able to use the inclusive language guide in their assessments and also that they've been able to use that to advocate for inclusive language within the classroom as well. Um, so there are a lot of students quite often that are kind of more progressive and more knowledgeable about the kind of language that they want to use um, in relation to diverse communities, but also in relation to themselves. So it's important that we really take that on and really learn from people's lived experience. And, and, and it's really good to hear that um, students feel empowered enough um, by the fact that a document that is an ECU document exists, um, that they feel empowered enough to be able to then use that um, to advocate for themselves within the classroom. Um, a lot of the time, and it's, it's still sort of quite, uh, I think, common within a academic environment for quite clinical and medicalized language to be used, um, particularly when we're referring to older, um, older articles, older texts, um, and even, I mean, even current day texts as well. Um, so I think, yeah, have, having this kind of resource that is available, not, not just as like a staff resource that's sort of um, kept in the background, but available to students and available to people more broadly has been really helpful in, in empowering people to, to advocate for themselves and the language that they use for themselves, but also language used for other diverse communities as well. Um, a lot of people have also sort of reached out to us around developing their own guidelines. And so we've been able to open up discussions um, and talk about inclusive language with people from universe, other universities, um, people from other organizations more generally. Um, sometimes people aren't necessarily even interested in developing their own guidelines. They're just interested in being able to use the resource itself. Um, so it's been really great to see people wanting to be able to use that resource. And, and, it's, and it's been really exciting to see that um, you know, people are, are excited to, to see this work happening. Um, I think sometimes when you're in the work that you're doing, you don't realise sometimes straight away, at least, the impact that your work is having. So to see people really appreciate that the guide exists um, is a really good indicator, I think, of how much it was needed um, and how much more work we have to do in terms of how we um, respect and how we talk about diverse communities. Um, one of the big bits of feedback or I say big bits of feedback but one of the bits of feedback I guess that we've had um, with the guide um, being that it is um, a little bit longer than just a couple of pages we've we've been asked a couple of times about whether we can make the guide into a sort of quick guide like a quick refer to kind of guide um, that people can just sort of look at um, if they need to um, as they go 
And we sort of talked within our team about this a little bit back and forth because we were worried, I guess, that um, that by doing so, that people wouldn't necessarily understand the nuance and the context of the language that is used in different situations. Um, so throughout the throughout the document, there are a couple of tables that say, you know, instead of use this, use this. Um, but we thought it was really important to have that background, to have that context and that education around that language, um, as much as it was to have the literal language itself to use. And there's so much language that can be used in different contexts as well. So as Kay was mentioning before, it's not quite black and white. Um, it depends on context. It depends on whether it's in-group language or out-of-group language. Um, it depends on the type of community that we're talking about. And there's also communities within communities. So it, it really was more nuanced than I think just having like a quick table to look at to, to see what to use um, could potentially provide. So essentially we decided to not um, make a quick guide because it was really important for people in order to understand inclusive language to have that context behind the, the communities that they're referring to. So we'll just go over a case study as well. So I'll read out the case study. Um, so an autistic undergraduate psychology student attends a lecture on the topic of developmental disabilities. The lecturer starts talking about autism and how devastating an autism diagnosis might be to a, a child's family. They go on to show a video of an autistic child having a meltdown in a shopping centre and negative reactions from onlookers. The lecturer talks negatively about what they describe as low functioning autistic children. Then they show a picture of the character Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory and say that people with Asperger's syndrome can be very intelligent but struggle socially. Sorry, sorry, Kay. Just, just oh. slow, could you just slow it down a little bit, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Thank sorry. you. Just challenging when you read it out, it just goes a little fast. Oh, sorry to okay. interrupt. Um, Thank the student leaves the class early and upset. She was initially excited about covering the topic, but is now not interested in engaging with the content. Um, so the first question that we have is, what kind of language did the lecturer use that was not inclusive or outdated? Um, so please feel free to, to respond in the chat um, if you can. Yeah, so from Tracy, um, low functioning or Asperger's, um, which is correct. So low functioning, um, yeah, devastating as well. Um, so low functioning is often a term that's used with outside of the autism community to describe someone who has autism with an intellectual disability. Um, and then the term high functioning is used to describe someone with autism um, without an intellectual disability. Um, and that's not really correct because the idea of functioning um, can change in different situations. So um, when we talk about low functioning or high functioning, it's often the perception of outsiders looking in at an autistic person having a really hard time and assuming that, oh, this person's low functioning or this person's high functioning. But that the idea of functioning is the ability to respond to and cope in your environment. So often the way that people function is dependent in the environments that they're in part of. So for me, um, in particular environments, I might be seen as high functioning, um, but in particular environments seen as low functioning, dependent on the amount of sensory input that I can see. So someone who might not be accommodated for, um, although might not be a person with autism with an intellectual disability, might appear to be low functioning or assumed to be low functioning in different environments. However, the idea of functioning as well, like what is, what is it like to function as a person? People go through hard times, people go through really happy times. And so the ability, it doesn't describe the ability for an autistic person to cope in their in certain scenarios. And is often defined on outside perspectives. So doesn't it explain how an autistic person might feel in, feel internally and feel in their different environments, but more the, the idea that um, it's the effect that a, a autistic person has on the people around them. Um, so we don't use the term low functioning or high functioning. We can describe someone as having autism with an intellectual disability or having autism without an intellectual disability, or just describing someone as autistic or having, having autism. Um, so comparing with a fictional character, yeah, um, from Bendika. Um, yes, completely agree. So the, um, there are some fictional characters that are good representations of autism and authentic rep representations of autism 
autism. A recent one is Chloe Hayden, who's an autistic actress um, who's played plays the character Quinny um, in Heartbreak High. That's quite an authentic representation of autism because the character is played by an autistic actress and the character is an autistic character and it doesn't rely on those harmful stereotypes about autistic people to get laughs or to get the storyline to go ahead. Um, Characters like Sheldon Cooper often perpetuate quite harmful stereotypes of autistic people as being inflexible or being very, um, not having that lived expect expertise or being difficult to live with or things like that or being mean. Um, those are the kind of perceptions that we have about autistic people that aren't real. Um, Jim Parson, who plays Sheldon Cooper, is not an autistic person, doesn't quite understand what it's like to be an autistic person, so it perpetuates those kind of harmful stereotypes that we have about autism. Um, yes, everyone loving Chloe and Heartbreak High in the comments. Um, the emotive language, thank you, Maria, as well. So having a devastating um, impact on or to, or on the child's family is not right. Um, autism is a diagnosis. Uh, the child was autistic beforehand. The child is autistic now. Um, it doesn't have a devastating impact on that child's family. Um, it's uh, an autism diagnosis allows of a family to make sense of why their child is the way that they are and how to best support their child. Um, but saying that it's devastating for someone to be diagnosed with autism makes it seem like autism is a burden on that family or that it, it might be difficult for the family to accept that their child is autistic, but that doesn't mean that it's devastating um, to a family to have an autistic child. Um, yeah, so and Asperger's, Asperger's um, is in our inclusive language guide and it's a difficult one to talk about because Asperger's, although it's no longer diagnosed um, to children now or adults are no longer diagnosed as having Asperger's syndrome, um, originally they were and the term for the, dif the differentiation between an autism diagnosis and an Asperger's diagnosis um, was a difference in a child not having a language delay or having a language delay but colloquially we've it's become understood that having Asperger's syndrome is a smart person with autism or an intelligent person with autism and that's not right um, anyone with autism can be intelligent um, and Asperger's is based on a, a list of criteria um, that are quite ableist to start with but also have uh, have um, the term Asperger's has a history um, that is quite anti-semitic um, so we don't use the term Asperger's anymore. However, if you are a person with autism who describes yourself as having Asperger's syndrome or being an Aspie, that is an identity term that you can use. And it's valid for you to use an identity term that best fits with your lived experience. And even historically for people who are diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, that can be a community term or a way for them to find people that are like them. So it's not as easy as saying it's wrong to use the term Asperger's or it's right to use the term Asperger's in different contexts. Um, the second question that we have is how might this lecture impact the student beyond their initial response? Uh, um, also someone's brought out the meltdown um, video. So this is something that um, even when I was doing a psychology unit was shown, um, showing a child in a shopping centre having a meltdown. Um, a meltdown is something that autistic people can experience when their ability to cope um, with a situation is overcome or their ability to regulate their sensory input in a situation is overcome. Um, and it's quite a vulnerable moment and it's quite scary to be an autistic person having a meltdown in a public area. So when parents or caregivers film children um, having a meltdown or having quite a vulnerable moment and posting it online um, and the understanding of awareness of autism, it's really showing an autistic person at their highest level of distress. Um, and that might reflect an autistic person's lived experience. Um, and it's not, it's not very helpful when we talk about autism to just talk about autistic people in distress. And although there are lots of autistic people that are in distress, um, often there are when an autistic person is accommodated for, we can reduce that ability for them to be distressed. Um, so I think that focusing so much on autistic distress and not thinking about other ideas around autism is quite harmful as well. Um, so from Danny, uh, the student could experience flashbacks to the classroom incident that could be traumatizing or impact their sense of self in a negative way. Um, yeah, especially like uh, this is a situation that's a real life situation. Um, 
a similar situation happened to me when I was studying a psychology unit in my undergrad and we were talking about autism um, and the floor was really dominated by people who didn't quite understand what it's like to be autistic and I felt quite unsafe to go back into that classroom because I assumed that I could not disclose the fact that I was autistic because people had these harmful ideas about autism. Um, it might influence how other students um, sorry, my, it's just scrolled up a little bit, um, influence how other students and language they may perpetuate. Exactly, the student may feel not worthy or not valued and they might not want to go to class. Um, oh, thank you, Danny. Um, but yes, so that might impact the student beyond just this lecture, but also impact how the student might feel about continuing on with their course or how safe that they feel at university or how respected or valued they feel at university. Um, and the third question that we have is what kind of language could the lecturer use instead? Uh, thank you to Lyndall for sharing. There's a bit about Dr. Hans Asperger's if anyone wants to read about that. Um, but what kind of language could the lecturer have used instead of words like low functioning or high functioning? Um, yes, and the, stu and the, st the student might avoid the lecture instead of seeking help when needed. Um, just using the term autism or using the term disabled student um, or just talking about talking about autism in a way that gives autonomy to, and self-determination to autistic people. Um, so maybe sharing information from an autistic advocate, um, maybe sharing information from a personal story from an autistic person instead of putting together all of these like stereotypes about autistic people um, to describe what it's like to be autistic. Um, yeah, so atypical is, um, or it's a spectrum, exactly. Um, thank you, Naomi. So that it's different. People with autism can experience different things, unconscious bias um, or neurodiverse or neurodivergent. Um, so neurodiverse being describing a population of people who have different neurotypes and neurodivergent describing an individual who has a neurotype that differs from what we think is a typical um, neurotype. But we'll move on to the second. Thank you very much for all of the response in the chat. Um, I'll move on to the second scenario and pass back to Stevie. So the second scenario that we have is about a non-binary student. So a non-binary student is participating in a volunteer peer mentoring program, which assists new students to the university during orientation. When the student registers for the program, they are assured by administrators that their firm name has been noted and used and will be used in all interactions and communications moving forward. When they arrive at orientation, they notice the program coordinator has printed their program materials and name tag with their legal name, which some trans and gender diverse people may refer to as their dead name. The student tries to quietly explain the issue to the program coordinator who says their legal name out loud while trying to rectify the situation, explains that it's not his fault and tells the student that he understands because people use his full name instead of his nickname all the time. So, what kind of language did the program coordinator use that was not inclusive or may have been outdated is the first question that we have. <laughs> Yikes from Tracy, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, so um, it's not an ideal situation. And again, um, elements of this story is kind of taken from personal experience, um, my personal experience as well. Um, and I think I'm just looking at the chat here, um, insensitivity to the fact that this is not a preferred nickname. Yep, definitely. So looking at um, sometimes people try to relate to other people, which I think can be really well-intentioned, um, but it can come across um, and certainly is uh, can be quite offensive when um, a nickname versus someone's affirmed name um, and the implications of not using someone's affirmed name for a trans person is very different to someone using a nickname. Um, you have the potential to out someone, um, you might be putting them in an unsafe situation and um, it's really important to, to not do that and to make sure that you're affirming someone. Um, so maybe, you know, trying to use a student number instead to, to correctly identify a student or something like that might be more helpful than using their dead name, um, particularly in like a, a social sort of setting. Um, and if you do have to sort of for clarity reasons, uh, ensure that you have the right student, uh, maybe in a private setting, um, explain to them that they do need to just understand um, 
that they are talking about the same person um, and they really do um, apologize um, for having to bring up um, a dead name, for example, but making sure that that's in a private situation if that was the case. Most of the time though, you can you can say, you know, okay, sorry about that and, and change things. And um, there's not necessarily a need um, outside of maybe just referencing a student number to make sure that it's the same student that you're talking about or something like that, that could be really helpful. Um, or even just saying like, do you still go by this name? Uh, like, do you still go by your legal name? So even just referring to legal name or a firm name, that kind of thing can be really helpful because the person will know what you're talking about if they need um, you to be using um, their affirmed name instead. Um, so um, just looking, yeah. So um, someone said indiscreet, no need to speak loudly about a sensitive issue. Um, the student tries to explain quietly and the coordinator then broadcasts it. Yeah, definitely really um, horrible situation for that person to be in, especially when they've gone to the lengths that they've gone to, um, to be able to try and um, stop that situation from happening and, and to get that assurance from um, a staff member. Uh, and I'm sure we can all probably within the university setting testify to how difficult it is to get that consistency with things like names and affirmed name um, across lots of different systems. So I completely understand um, that that is, is a really difficult thing to do, um, which is why I think um, ensuring that we treat every person as potentially trans or gender diverse, obviously not everyone is, but um, treating everyone as if they may potentially be and being really sensitive regardless of whether we perceive that person to potentially be trans and gender diverse or not. Um, uh, as a non-binary person, thank you for using this example. Definitely very cringy, yeah. <laughs> very cringy indeed, yeah. Um, uh, as it has released ICT guidelines for accessible ICT procurement. That's really helpful to know. And there's a, there's a, a, a link there. So that, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gabrielle. Um, uh, that should read saying it's nickname or a preferred name as well as saying it's not my fault and broadcasting it. Yeah, good point, Kerry. So yeah, all, all really good points there. Everyone's kind of um, latched onto that already. Um, I will sort of make mention as well, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it in there, but um, the differentiation between um, saying preferred or um, affirmed, or even when it comes to pronouns as well. Um, I think old language really looks at preferred pronouns, preferred name. Um, whereas when we talk about trans and gender diverse people, we really need to be sure that we're not um, invalidating their experience because realistically, if someone says that that's their name and someone says that these are their pronouns, they're not preferred, they just are, um, which is why we sort of use um, interchangeably um, at ECU preferred or affirmed um, name um, because it might be preferred for some people, it might be a nickname, um, and for other people it might be their affirmed name and, and it's not, really not a preference, it just that's the name that they want you to use, that is their name. So um, I think it's really mindful to be be uh, really, really careful around using that term prefer preferred and ideally not using the term preferred at all. Um, it's just, you know, what is your pronouns? Um, what is your name kind of thing? Um, what name would you like me to use for you kind of thing? Um, so how might this make, uh, how might this have made the student feel? I think we've kind of clarified a little bit that it's a really, <laughs> a really kind of shocking situation and it wouldn't have made the student feel well at all, alienated, unsupported, put on the spotlight, unwelcome or even safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially when they were assured that, um, you know, this wouldn't be the case, that their affirmed name would be used. Um, and I think, um, like I said before, obviously there are lots of different systems within a university context and it is hard to, it's hard to assure a student consistency across the whole thing. So I think being really transparent about that and saying, you know, look, we've, we've transferred your name into these particular systems. Um, this doesn't necessarily flow into all systems. So your legal name may still appear in other systems, um, but sort of using that sort of affirming language and having that conversation um, with someone, if they are trying to get that clarity, I think can be really helpful as well, um, just so people know what to expect. So even if this situation did happen and their legal name accidentally did appear here, they, they understood that potentially that was going to be an outcome and they might've been able to sort of, you know, try and get that sorted out beforehand or, you know, that, that staff member might've been able to support them to sort that out beforehand as well. Um, and how could the program coordinator have approached the situation differently? Again, I think they might have um, 
there might be some in here already, but someone said the administrators should have followed up. Yep, definitely. Um, you know, if, if there's a way for you to be able to, um, you know, get in contact with the people um, as a staff member, get in contact with the people that are going to be running a program or for a staff member. Um, I know within our within our team, we have um, the student success team, which is an amazing team that supports our students to do um, various different things and, and to essentially be, you know, have a successful um, time at, um, at ECU and they have been really integral to supporting trans and gender diverse students to reach out to staff members to say, look, this, this person is a trans person or this person is a non-binary person and they, um, they go by this name, but this name is maybe what appears on the role and just ensuring that you know, they have that sort of linkage with um, lecturers and things like that to stop that situation from happening, stop that dead naming from happening before it does happen. So um, if you have systems in place to be able to support students to do that, some might take it up, some might not, but if you have those systems in place um, to ensure that um, lecturers and, and tutors are using that language and mindful of that language beforehand, um, that can be really great as well. Um, that's it from us. And um, I'll just get, yeah, there we go. Um, so that's, that's our information here. Um, if you wanna get in contact with us, um, we really appreciate you being so engaging, um, being so engaged and, and listening to our presentation. Um, thank you so much for having us. And if you have any questions either about the, the situations, the scenarios that we put forward or just about our presentation in general, please do let us know. Thanks, Stevie. Thanks, Kay. That was really fabulous. And I can see from all the comments and hearts and thumbs up that um, people have really appreciated it. Does anybody have any questions that they might have put in the Q&A chat that they have as burning questions? There was one question um, uh, that I've answered already about where to find the um, ECU uh, language guide. And we have a link from it from our ADSET page as well. Um, the other open question we've got, um, Bobby says, this is a slightly off topic, I loved Extraordinary Attorney Woo, but I do wonder what others in this group think of this series. Is it a fair portrayal? I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard good things, but perhaps um, maybe Kay or Stevie can talk generally about the portrayal of people with disability or LGBTIQ plus people in films and TVs who perhaps aren't represented uh, representatives of those communities. I haven't personally seen, <laughs> seen that either, unfortunately, sorry, but um, I, I can maybe speak to, I'm not sure of the character, but if I, I, I can probably speak a little bit to, to queer representation and trans representation. I think it sort of very much follows a similar line to what Kay was saying about um, disabled communities in that um, often it is very much perpetuating those uh, stereotypes about what it means to be queer, what it means to be trans. And if I can talk specifically to trans and gender diverse people, often there's very much that um, portrayal of uh, tragedy, trauma, pain, um, all, the, all these negative things, which can be part of someone's experience as a trans person, but is definitely not the only part of that experience. And what we're seeing more of in representation is lived experience, which is really great. So lived experience of trans and gender diverse people acting and, be, and you know, writing and, and, and you know, um, releasing books and, and things like that so that we have those accurate portrayals. Um, because it's drawn from their lived experience, but also storylines that are focusing on, you know, the difficult, but also the joy that comes with being part of these communities, because there is a lot of joy in being able to identify a particular way, being able to find community, um, being able to re reject, um, I think, what it means to be normal and what it means to fit in, um, because quite often that is quite difficult depending on, on where you grow up and what context you grow up in. It can be quite difficult, um, but also acknowledging that some people do have just really positive experiences throughout as well. It's not, you know, any kind of like trauma or, you know, it's any kind of like difficulty isn't necessarily experienced by every single trans person or every single disabled person. So acknowledging the nuance in that as well. And that um, while, while a lot of trans and gender diverse people may experience a lot of difficulty 
difficulty. Some people might have just grown up in really inclusive environments where it's hasn't really been, um, you know, hasn't been a consideration that they wouldn't be accepted by their family and things like that. So I think exploring that nuance and we're seeing that more and more these days. And again, it's, it's I think, probably um, something that we all know, but really centering that lived experience um, to provide that really accurate portrayal, I think is really important. Great. Thanks, Stevie. Um, another question is, um, is the inclusive language guide incorporated into a mandatory staff training that staff are required to undertake? So when we released the inclusive language guide, we did a bit of a roadshow. Um, and so um, through our equity and diversity committee, which sort of oversees equity and diversity um, throughout the university, our representatives from each of the different schools. So um, as part of rolling out um, that, it was sort of initially rolled out and approved through that committee and then um, communicated to each of the sort of uh, head director areas um, to share with each of the teams so that we could go around and actually present within team meetings about the release of the guide about how it might be useful and to get any questions answered um, so I guess to answer your question no it's not in any kind of formal capacity you know included however it is embedded as well into existing training that we do deliver so we do have um, LGBTIQA plus training, our ally training, which it's embedded into. We have our disability access and inclusion training, and we have our cultural awareness training that draws on from um, existing language that we were already using. And in fact, we used to develop the guidelines in the first place. So there's that consistency um, with that there. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, no, unfortunately it's not. There's no sort of like, you know, inclusive language guide or inclusive language training specifically that's, um, that's available to staff it's more embedded across the board yeah I think that's really tough to considering all the um, training that we're all meant to do um, it's hard to slip another one in but I but again on our pages we've got some reference to some inclusive language um, resources and pages um, we've just got time for one more question um, we know that many students experience can be made or broken when it comes to how an academic or teacher handles a situation of their lived experience of disability or gender identity, what would your advice be for those who try and may get it wrong? How can we empower them to try and try again to get it right? Do you want me to go first, Kay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I think empowering, uh, sorry, empowering staff to, to try, mm. keep trying. Um, I think obviously training is a big component, um, but yeah, it, it's obviously difficult when when training isn't necessarily um, isn't isn't necessary compulsory for all staff members. I think I think it can sometimes come back to relating it to the individual person. So a lot of the time, I think um, for me, because there's a lot of a lot of I guess. Uh, controversy controversy surrounding trans and gender diversity like or you know people try to push that there's controversy around it um, and so that can sometimes make it difficult to me to portray to someone else why it's so important to you know use someone's name and pronouns or to you know respect someone's identity because people are like oh it's just you know it's something new it's not you know um it's it's not necessary it's you know this didn't this didn't happen in my you know those kind of this didn't happen in my day kind of thing um, so I think that sometimes that can be really hard because of all those negative perceptions about, you know, trans and gender diverse people not really being valid. Um, so I think relating it to the individual experience, so being able to relate it to and talk about um, uh, culture and race and religion and um, you know, getting people to be able to relate to it on a personal level and, you know, you wouldn't want hopefully someone to you know address you in a particular way or not believe you or not um, affirm your identity not use your pronouns so it's about that sort of um i guess respect um thanks Jamie. i that's think that's great. probably yeah kay did you have anything to add to that um i was just saying that like <clears throat> i think it's important to acknowledge intent as well even if um it doesn't go the way that would be the most inclusive acknowledging that intent and that um needing to go from ignorance um, or putting the effort in to move from that ignorance into a more inclusive space. I know that um, often when I go to different services um, that 
inclusive language might not be there from the get-go, but if you're open to that kind of feedback, um, I think that's really important. Um, but also as a disabled person, often I experience lots of different non-inclusive language um, from different service providers. So having that openness to change, I think is quite important. Right. Well, thank you again both for um, your time this morning and thanks to all our participants. Um, Saturday was the International Day of People with Disability, so there was lots of discussion happening over the weekend and we'll certainly be um, providing some more information um, in our upcoming newsletter. Um, this is our last webinar for the year, so don't cry, you can go back and look at all of our 20 or so webinars that we've done this year. And we really rely on um, you as the community to tell us what you'd like to hear. So if you've got any ideas over summer, um, let us know um, what topics you would like to hear from next year. So once again, thank you, Stevie and Kay and our live captioner, um, Jason, um, and Jane, of course, for organising and wrangling all these webinars. So she's going to put some links into the chat for, um, for a survey and look out for our webinars for the new year. My cat has just decided it wants some lunch and I think everybody else wants lunch too. So thank you again, everyone. Thanks so much for having us.